Hello everyone and welcome to Endeavor's Q2 and Half Year 2023 results webcast. Before we start, please note the usual disclaimer. Today's format will be similar to what we did for our end of year results. We have prepared a video which matches the slide order of the PDF results presentation which is available on our website homepage, so feel free to follow along. We hope that you find this more engaging and enjoy the video content. Sebastian will start with a recap of our key accomplishments for the first half year. Then Jaria will talk about our latest ESG initiatives. Guy will then outline the financial results before Mark provides a detailed operational review. And finally, Jono will update us on the exciting progress being made at our Tanda Iguala discovery. So make sure you stay tuned until the end. After Sebastian's closing remarks, we'll open the floor to questions. And now I will hand it over to Sebastian. Thank you, Martino, and hello, everyone. For the first half of the year, we've continued to deliver against six key focus areas with the goal of unlocking near-term value for all of our stakeholders. I'll go through each area in detail, but as a quick summary, on the operational front, we are on track to meet our full year guidance for the 11th consecutive year. In line with our strategy of actively managing our portfolio to focus on higher quality assets, we were pleased to close the sale of our non-core Bungu and Wanyo mines during the period. The quality of our portfolio is set to further increase as our two gross projects, the Sabadola Masawa Biox project in Senegal and the Lafigue project in Côte d'Ivoire are progressing well. Both are on budget and on schedule to commence production in Q2 and Q324, respectively. Alongside this year's investment in our organic pipeline, we are pleased to continue to deliver attractive shareholder returns and have declared a H123 dividend for $100 million. On an annual basis, this represents $25 million more than the minimum dividend commitment for the year. Given that the Sabadola Masawa expansion and the Lafigue Greenfield build are expected to both increase the group production and lower our cost base, they will further enhance our capability to reward our stakeholders. As such, our goal is to increase our shareholder returns program once our organic growth projects are completed, thereby ensuring that our efforts to unlock growth immediately benefit all our stakeholders. On the exploration front, in the first half of the year, we have accelerated our exploration efforts at our Tenda Iguela discovery, where we have drilled over 95,000 meters during the last six months. As such, we've decided to increase the full year drill program at Tenda to 180,000 meters and remain on track to publish a resource update later this year. As part of our ESG strategy, We've launched several new initiatives which aim to protect the places where we operate and promote sustainable socio-economic growth in our host communities. We've also launched the construction of our Sabodala solar plant, which has the dual benefit of reducing our emissions and decreasing our operational cost. I will now dive deeper into each of these themes, starting with our asset sales. The divestment was well aligned to our long-term strategy of progressively upgrading the quality of our portfolio. You will probably recognize my favorite magic box chart. As you can see, our non-core Bungu and Wanyo mines were clear outliers in the portfolio with higher cost and shorter mine lives. They were also our two smallest mines. The divestment of these mines allows management to focus on the core mines while also increasing our geographic diversification. Prior to the sale, Burkina Faso represented 55% of this year's production, while it now represents 44% of production from our continuing operation. This is expected to decrease to around 30% next year, following the completion of the La Figue build in Côte d'Ivoire and the Sabadola Masawa expansion in Senegal. We were pleased to sell the assets to a trusted Burkinabe-focused business that shares our commitment to operate the mines in the best interest of employees and local stakeholders. 
We wish again to thank our Bungu and Wanyu employees for their commitment and professionalism and local stakeholders for their support, which has contributed to Endeavour's success over the past several years. We wish them further success. Overall, we expect to add proceeds of more than $300 million from both assets, comprised of upfront and deferred payments, in addition to NSRs, which also allows us to retain further upside. These proceeds will allow us to complete our ongoing constructions with a healthy balance sheet, accelerating our ability to increase our shareholder returns program. Following the divestment of Bungu and Wanyong, we have updated our production guidance to around 1.1 million ounces at an all-in sustaining cost of below $950 per ounce. So far this year, we produced 511,000 ounces at an all-in sustaining cost of below $980 per ounce, which places us on track to meet our guidance for the year. As we have previously guided, we expect performance to be weighted toward the second half of the year as we expect stronger production at lower cost at our Hyundai, Sabadora Masawa and Mana Mines. And as you can see on the screen, we're pleased that this operating performance continues to be achieved safely with a sector-leading safety record. Looking at the half-year production and the all-in sustaining cost trend, you can see that production decreased in line with the guided trend, while all-in sustaining costs remained below 1,000. Mark will run you through the mine-by-mine -mine asset performance later, but at a high-level production decreased at Hyundai and Sabadora Masawa due to an increased focus on stripping activity, which resulted in lower-grade ore being processed. While at MANA, production decreased due to an increased focus on underground development, with supplemental ore being sourced from the lower grain Maula open pit. At a group level, this was partly offset by increased production at ET, which is on track to achieve another very strong year. In light of our efforts over the past six months, we are on track to achieve a stronger performance across our mines in the second half of the year. Turning to our operating cash flow, before working capital movements, you can see a modest decrease as the higher gold price only partially offset the expected lower production at higher cost. This cash flow profile is linked to our mine plan sequencing, which as mentioned earlier, is expected to yield stronger cash flow in the upcoming quarters. As an aside, you can also see with the grey shaded area that the cash flow from the discontinued operation continued to fall each period, further demonstrating the rationale behind the divestment. While in the short term we expect to generate stronger cash flow through our flagship assets, by this time next year we expect to see a significant uptick in cash flow as both our gross projects will have been commissioned. To look at them in more detail, let me first elaborate on our Sabadora Masawa expansion project. We are extremely excited about this project because of both its strategic and financial benefits. Once this expansion is completed, the Sabadala Masawa mine will rank as a tier 1 asset capable of producing more than 400,000 ounces per year, thereby increasing the quality of our portfolio and further diversifying our production base. In addition, Based on the exploration success to find oxide ore, we are confident to be able to further boost production in the short term. I will let Mark provide details on the build within his section, but at a high level, construction work is progressing on budget, with 75% of the $290 million initial capital cost now committed. He is also tracking on schedule with first gold from the Biox plant expected during the second quarter of next year. Moving now to our next gross project, which is our La Figue Greenfield development in Côte d'Ivoire. It will be another cornerstone asset for the company with an envisaged annual production of over 200,000 ounces over the initial 13-year mine life at a low all-in sustaining cost of below $900 per ounce. 
Construction activities have ramped up fairly quickly, as you can see. We have now committed around 60% of initial capital, with cost in line with expectations, and we are on track for first production in Q3 next year. As you see in the production chart, these two projects will deliver growth next year with the full year benefit seen in 25. We see production increasing to above 1.3 million ounces in 2025 with strong potential for further increased production based on the continued outperformance at ET and Hyundai. We also anticipate bringing in more oxides at Sabadola Masawa to lift production well beyond 400,000 ounces. And in addition, we see La Figue outperforming its nameplate capacity as most of our plants do. But equally important, this growth will allow us to maintain industry-leading all-in sustaining costs of below $950 per ounce. Shifting now to our ongoing exploration efforts, which continue to generate excitement amongst the team, so far this year, we spent over $50 million with a significant focus on our greenfield discovery, Tenda Iguela. And owing to the ongoing success there, we have decided to increase this year's budget from $65 million to $80 million for our continuing operations. In the first half of the year, we drilled over 95,000 meters at Tenda, which is already more than the 70,000 meters originally planned. With the updated budget, we are now targeting to drill 180,000 meters this year. Tenda Iguala continues to show its potential to be a tier one asset, and we are excited to work towards publishing an updated resource estimate later this year. But our exploration success isn't limited just to Tenda. We've made significant progress across our producing assets. At Hyundai, for example, we've identified extensions at the Carry Pump and Carry West deposits. Also at Hyundai, we have potentially made a game-changing discovery as we confirmed high-grade mineralization below the Vindalu deposit, which shows the potential to delineate a sizable high-grade underground resource. We will be following up on this in the upcoming drill programs. At Sabadola Masawa, we are expanding resources at Kiesta, Nyakifiri, and Kerekunda, which could provide non-refractory ore and help lift production. At ET, we are looking to expand resources at the Flotuo, Walter Bacatuo, and Yopleu Legale deposits, and we are testing also new targets. While at MANA, we've been busy testing ore shoots at Wona Underground and expanding resources at the Maula and Niafe open pits. This success across the group leaves us well positioned to meet our five-year discovery target, which has been updated to reflect the divestment of the non-core Bungu and Wanyo mines from 15 to 20 million ounces of indicated resources to 12 to 17 million ounces of indicated resources over the 2021 to 2025 period at the low discovery cost of less than $25 per ounce. While we continue to grow our business organically through our development projects and exploration, another important capital allocation priority for us is to continue to return capital to our shareholders. For H1, we have announced a dividend of $100 million, which on an annualized basis would represent $25 million more than our minimum dividend for this year. This reiterates our commitment to paying supplemental shareholder returns, despite our other capital allocation priorities this year, including significant growth and exploration. In addition to our dividend, we have returned over $20 million in share buybacks year to date, which means that since the launch of the program in early 21, we've bought back more than $250 million worth of shares, representing over 11 million shares, which is equivalent to approximately 5% of our current shares outstanding. To put this into context, 
it means that approximately $200 per ounce produced in H1 was returned to shareholders. Or to put it in another way, 10% of our revenue was distributed to shareholders, corresponding to over 30% of our operating cash flow. It also means that we returned an attractive indicative yield of over 4% for the half year, coupled with, of course, strong value creation by unlocking our gross potential. Overall, this means that our progressive shareholder returns program has now returned over $750 million in the form of dividends and share buyback since we declared our first dividend in 2020 and commenced payment in early 2021. To put this in context, we've returned approximately 13% of our market cap since the beginning of our returns program. Another way to look at it is that we delivered significantly more than the capital required to build a new mine. Looking ahead, once we finish our current two builds by mid next year, we then expect to refocus on further strengthening our balance sheet and increasing our shareholder returns before potentially launching a new build, thereby ensuring that our efforts to unlock growth provide immediate benefits to all our stakeholders. Before I hand over to the team, I just wanted to reflect on our LSE listing following its two-year anniversary. We are very pleased with our listing given that over 50% of our trading volume is now occurring on the UK line. This is a great outcome given that we didn't issue equity into the UK along with our listing. As you can see on the chart, getting included into the FTSE 100 and MSCI UK indices has clearly helped drive appetite for our stock. The volume increase is also reflective of the change in our shareholder base, which has seen UK and European shareholders climb up the register. Now we'll hand over to Jaya to share some ESG initiatives with you. Thank you. In our recent resort webcast, Sebastian has mentioned how mining has the potential to be one of the most impactful industries in contributing to improvements in living standard, particularly in West Africa where we operate. During this webcast, we often take the opportunity to share some of our latest ESG updates. And I am pleased to announce several new environmental initiatives that we've launched this past quarter. In April, we committed to the reforestation of 30 hectares of Crozalier Forest located near our ET mine in Côte d'Ivoire. This is aligned with our biodiversity strategy to protect and preserve the places where we operate. It also serves to support new green jobs and sustainable livelihood through program management, monitoring and evaluation. In June, we launched our Towards Zero Plastic Strategy on World Environmental Day with awareness campaigns and public area cleans up across our site and communities. The two-year strategy also aims to work with our suppliers to reduce the generation of plastic waste and most importantly, encourage the development of projects that recover and add value to the remaining plastic. More information regarding our ESG initiatives and performance is detailed in our sustainability report, which was launched earlier this quarter. As part of our drive to continually improve our disclosure, we have continued to augment our reporting with an ESG data center and dedicated fact sheet outlining how we manage our key impact. We continue to make significant progress with the implementation of our ESG strategy and I look forward to sharing more examples in the quarters to come. Thank you. Thank you, Joria, and hello to everyone joining us today. Sebastian covered the high-level half-year picture, so I'll walk you through the quarterly variations. In summary, 
our production from continuing operations was up 10% this quarter over the first quarter, while our all-in sustaining cost was up 5%. The stronger production, along with a 4% higher realized gold price, drove significantly higher net earnings and EBITDA, while our operating cash flow was lower due to the seasonally higher tax payments. I'll now take you through the details, starting with our all-in sustaining cost. Our quarterly production from continuing operations increased by 25,000 ounces to 268,000 ounces as production increased at both Hyundai and Sabadala Masawa, driven by improvements in processed grades in line with the mine sequence and higher recoveries. All-in sustaining cost increased to $1,000 per ounce. This was due to higher costs at ITI as a result of increased reliance on self-generated power and at MANA due to an increased focus on underground development. Owing to the strong gold price during the quarter, we maintained a robust all-in sustaining margin of $947 per ounce. Turning now to our operating cash flow, which decreased by 23% to $159 million in Q2 as a result of the higher taxes paid during the quarter. Typically, we make higher tax payments in both Q2 and in Q3. In Q2, we pay our full year tax payments for the prior year and provisional payments for the upcoming year. And in Q3, we typically upstream cash from our operating entities and pay withholding tax on this cash. As an aside, you will see in the gray in the chart the cash flow from discontinued operations, which were not generating significant cash flow for the group. This underlines an advantage the sale of the non-core assets will have, allowing management to refocus our efforts on the cash generative core assets. Here you can see a bridge of our quarter over quarter variances in operating cash flow. Moving from left to right, you'll note that we benefited from a $61 higher realized gold price, as well as an increase of 6,000 ounces of gold sales. Our operating expenses and other items increased as a result of higher volume related mining costs at Hyundai and Savadala Misawa, and increased processing costs across the group, given higher tons milled as well as increased corporate and exploration costs. As mentioned, the income taxes paid increased by $64 million in Q2 compared to Q1 due to increased payments across the portfolio related to the timing of final tax payments in relation to the 22 tax year and provisional payments for 2023. There was also a lower working capital outflow as the cash outflow and in inventories driven by stockpile bills was partially offset by an inflow of prepaid expenses at Sabadala Masawa. Overall, this meant that we generated $159 million in operating cash during the quarter, equivalent to 64 cents per share. Moving on to our net debt position, you can see that we continue to maintain a healthy financial position with a net debt to EBITDA ratio of 0.15 times. As depicted in the waterfall chart, our net debt of $50 million as at the end of Q1 was reduced by the $159 million in operating cash flow generated from all operations for the quarter, and then offset by investing activities of $214 million. This included $22 million of sustaining capital, $61 million of non-sustaining capital, and $104 million of growth capital, which is mainly related to the Sabadala Masawa Biox expansion and the Lafigue Greenfield project. We also incurred $26 million in investing activities at our discontinued assets. Financing activities was a net outflow of $73 million, mainly comprised of the settlement of $29 million worth of call rights with Taurus linked to the Taranga transaction. In addition, we incurred $19 million of interest payments on our outstanding debt facilities and completed around $9 million of share buybacks. There was also a $7 million gain on the remeasurement of cash on hand which is held in non-US dollar denominated currencies. Overall, this means that we ended the quarter with a net debt of $171 million. As you can see from the evolution of our historic net debt, given the quick payback periods of our assets, our business has the potential to absorb debt during construction phases and rapidly deleverage itself. Our current leverage ratio stands at 0.15 times net debt to adjusted EBITDA, which is well below our target of 0.5 times. As such, the group is currently in a robust financial position with significant liquidity headroom to support our ongoing phase of growth while allowing us to continue to pay attractive shareholder returns. 
If we look at our debt structure, in order to manage short-term offshore cash flows during the quarter, we increased the size of our RCF to $645 million while maintaining the same favorable terms, and we drew down a further $155 million on the facility. In addition, in July, we have taken advantage of favorable financing terms in West Africa to arrange a $167 million term loan with the Syndicate of West African Banks, locking in competitive pricing for the five-year instrument. This term loan is a cheaper source of financing because it mitigates any requirements to upstream and downstream cash, which naturally incurs withholding taxes. We believe that our diversified long-term debt structure has us well positioned to continue to deliver our near-term growth with significant financial flexibility. Switching now to analyzing our profitability, our adjusted EBITDA increased by $13 million to $253 million, and we maintained an attractive EBITDA margin of close to 50%. As you can see here, the EBITDA margin has been fairly stable, while the operating cash flow showed more variability due to tax payments. Moving lastly to our net earnings, where I'll just focus on a number of key line items, we reported an increase in earnings from continuing operations, partially offset by an increase in exploration costs, in line with higher exploration activity at our Tandere Guela Greenfield property in Côte d'Ivoire. We benefited from gains on financial instruments, from the unrealized gains on gold collars and gold forwards, as the gold price increased in Q2, which compares to a loss in Q1. The combined effect of which was significantly higher net and comprehensive earnings as compared to last quarter. Adding back the impairment of $15 million related to expiration permits, reversing the $30 million gain on financial instruments and a number of other smaller adjustments, results in adjusted net earnings of $79 million for the quarter. I'd now like to hand over to Mark, who will take you through the details of our operations. Thank you, Guy, and hello to everyone on the call. Before I discuss our operating results, I'd like to touch on our strong safety performance. Over the last 12 months, our lost time injury frequency rate was 0.09, well below the industry average of 1.14, which is very encouraging, considering we are currently building two new growth projects and increasing our staffing levels every quarter. Despite this, we had one LTI at our continuing operations during the period, so we still have some work to do, as all these types of incidents are preventable. We are focused on improving training, frontline supervision and reviewing operating procedures to ensure that we eliminate all reportable incidents. Moving to our operations, I am pleased that the group remains on track to achieve full year production and cost guidance with a strong performance anticipated for the second half of the year. In fact, three out of the past four years have seen production weighted towards the second half. I will talk to each mine in a bit more detail, starting with Sabadala Masawa. However, given the time constraint, I will focus only on the continuing assets. At Sabadala Masawa, we are continuing to see the benefits of our ability to quickly bring new discoveries and existing resources into production. As an example, we were able to commence mining at the Nakafiri East Deposit in late quarter two, following a six months intense drilling program. As a reminder, this pit is close to the processing plant and access was possible once the village resettlement project was successfully completed. The Nyakafiri pit will provide supplemental higher grade non-refractory feed to the plant and replace ounces from the Sophia North Pit. Production increased as a result of a higher average grade being processed due to the increased contributions from the Masawa and Bambaraya pits. Higher tons milled and higher recovery rates compared to the previous quarter. All in sustaining costs also improved during the quarter. Benefiting from higher gold sales and lower sustaining capital as we completed less waste capitalisation during the period. In the second half of 2023, we expect to introduce additional higher grade oxide feed from the McAllington pit, which is just north of the Sophia North pit, which should further improve average grades. At Sabadala Masawa, we are fortunate to have so many resources in close proximity to the plant which provides options to manage ore types and grade 
through effective sequencing and blending. Moving on to the expansion project, I'm really happy to see how the biops plant construction is going, along with all of the other infrastructure. The structural, mechanical and piping work packages are all starting to take shape and we remain on budget and importantly schedule for a quarter to 2024 startup. As Sebastian stated, so far approximately $217 million or 75% of the initial $290 million growth capital has now been committed with pricing in line with expectations. As shown in the photos, the biox reactors and concentrate feed installation are now complete. CIL foundations have been installed with tank construction underway and the neutralisation tanks are nearing completion. We have made significant progress since we launched construction in the first half of 2022. The critical path items are the power plant construction and processing plant construction activities associated with the biox reactors. Last week we received the first tonne of bacteria on site which will serve as the feedstock to progressively grow and ramp up the bacteria population over the coming months using a separate set of small tanks to ensure that we have large enough volumes of bacteria to start production in quarter two next year. The 18 megawatt power plant extension is advancing on schedule and we now have all three generators installed. We expect them to be fully commissioned by the contractor by the end of the year. We look forward to keeping you updated each quarter as the project approaches completion in quarter two next year. And while we are talking about Sabadala, we are very excited to launch the construction of a 37 megawatt solar facility. We will install the solar plant around three kilometres away from the processing plant. To ensure we can regulate power availability, we will be adding a 16 megawatt battery system as well. The solar plant and battery system is expected to allow Sabadala to function on only one generator on clear sky days reducing fuel consumption by around 13 million litres a year. That is equivalent to a 24% reduction in our CO2 emissions. In total, the initial capex for the project will be $55 million, of which 10 million will be incurred in 2023, with the remainder in 2024 ahead of startup in Q1 2025. Importantly, power generated from the solar plant will cost around 1.4 cents per kilowatt hour compared to 18 cents for our self-generated power. This is a perfect example of an optimisation initiative that will not only reduce our costs, but also reduce our emissions and help to put us firmly on track towards our 2030 emissions targets. Now moving on to our Hyundai mine in Burkina Faso. Production increased during the second quarter in line with the mine sequence as we finished the current phase of pre-stripping at the carry pump pit. This allowed us to restart ore mining and introduce higher grade oxide ore into the mill feed. As a result, tonnes of ore mined and milled and average process grades increased in the quarter. All in sustaining costs decreased as a direct result of the higher volumes of gold sold during the quarter. This was partially offset by slightly higher mining and processing unit costs. As we head into the second half of the year, ore is expected to be sourced from the Carry Pump and Vindaloo main pits, with supplemental feed sourced from the Carry West pit. Production is therefore expected to be stronger in the second half of the year, as there should be less stripping activity, and we expect to have access to higher volumes of higher grade ore across the Carry Pump and Vindaloo main pits. I have just returned from a short trip to Iti, which had a very strong start to the year with a record throughput. There was lots of activity on site to anticipate the wet season and it is pleasing to see how far the mine has come with their preparations over the past four years so that they can minimise disruption from rain events. The strong performance in the first half of the year was due to a strong mill throughput coupled with high grade ore from the Itty Walter and La Plate pits along with high recovery rates. Due to the strong first half performance, particularly in terms of throughput, which has been achieving well above nameplate capacity, 
we have taken the decision to accelerate the construction of the second TSF to ensure that we have sufficient tailing storage capacity for the near future. Last year we identified the opportunity to add a resign circuit to improve recoveries, optimise costs by lowering cyanide consumption, potentially recovering additional gold and silver and reducing wad cyanide in the tailings. The resign project is approaching completion and should be fully commissioned in the second half of the year. Looking at further opportunities to optimise the operation, we have decided to launch the primary crusher optimisation project. The mineral sizer is an additional crusher that will run in parallel with the existing jaw crusher and is expected to allow us to remove a number of high cost mobile screens and crushers and rehandle for the soft oxide ore which is too sticky to go through the crusher. This will enable throughput to be maintained above 6 million tonnes per annum regardless of the ore blend. At MANA we are focused on advancing the underground development at Wainer so that we have sufficient mill feed to maintain production once the open pit feed from the Mayola pit is depleted in half one of next year. As a result of the underground development activity, production at Manor decreased during the second quarter as lower average grades were processed from Wainer underground as well as CU underground. Mayola open pit is a low grade ore source to provide supplemental feed to the mill, so the main focus will always be the underground mines. All in sustaining costs increase due to the lower volumes of gold sold, the increased focus on underground development and higher volumes of open pit tonnes mined. We expect to see a higher rate of production in the second half of the year as development work undertaken will enable increased access to stopes at Wona. Stoke production at CU is expected to advance into higher grades in the second half of the year. Moving on to our second development project, the Le Figue Greenfield project in Côte d'Ivoire, where we are making significant progress. It is really exciting to see the project advancing now that more than 50% of the initial 448 million capex has been committed and the project is tracking on budget and on schedule for start-up in Q3 next year. We are now using the airstrip which has been approved for flights which will really help the logistics as activity levels continue to increase. As a reminder, Le Figue has an envisaged annual production of over 200,000 ounces a year over its initial 13 year mine life at a low all in sustaining cost of below $900 per ounce. The build was only launched in Q4 last year following completion of a definitive feasibility study that confirmed Le Figue's potential to be a cornerstone asset for Endeavour. You can see the good progress we have made on civil and structural works as a primary crusher, high pressure grinding roll, bore mill, reclaimed tunnel and CIL tanks are all being built. Not shown in the photos is the water storage dam where construction is complete, whilst water harvest dam and TSF construction are both progressing well. The mining contractor has commenced mobilising to site and is building the necessary infrastructure. Construction of the 225 kilovolt power line continues to progress well. We are working around the wet season and are targeting to complete tower foundations beforehand so that we can advance on tower erection during the second half. The key milestones for the remainder of the year are the process plant, power line and TSF construction as well as the start of mining in quarter four. We are very pleased with the progress made at Le Figue and it is always very impressive to see a project advance from nearly nothing less than 12 months ago to a project that we expect to be producing from in less than 12 months time. Thank you and I will now hand over to Jono to provide a detailed update on the exploration program at Tanda Aguila. Thanks Mark and hello everyone. Given the significant drill program underway at our Tanda Aguila discovery in Cote d'Ivoire, I wanted to provide a more detailed update. We are very excited by the positive drilling results we've been getting which is why we've already exceeded our original plans for 2023 with more than 95,000 metres drilled so far this year at the project, of which 82,000 have been drilled at the Asafu deposit. We have been expanding the program using 10 rigs and we focus on converting mineral resources from inferred to indicated status. 
At the same time, we are delineating new resource to increase the overall size of the resource base. Our exploration team benefits from being part of a larger group with the ability to reallocate capital to projects that meet our investment criteria. That means that thankfully, we've been able to increase our initial exploration guidance for the full year from $65 million to $80 million, with all the increase being allocated towards Tanda Reguela. As a result, we have been able to increase our target of drilling 70,000 metres this year to a staggering 180,000 metres. Our maiden resource of 3 million ounces at 2 grams per tonne was defined based on around 60,000 metres of drilling, focused within a small portion of the identified mineralised trend. Since defining those resources late last year, we have extended the mineralised strike length by over 900 metres, as you can see on the map. That's 300 metres to the northwest and 600 metres to the southeast. As a result, we expect to include additional resources and a resource update in the second half of this year. At the Asafu deposit, within the dotted line on the map, we initially identified a significant fault structure that was separating the Beremian volcanic rocks to the northeast from the Tarquayan sandstones to the southwest. This structure proved to be a significant conduit for mineralisation, which is hosted adjacent to the structure within the Tarquayan sediments on the southwest side, as you can see on the map. We like the Asafu deposit a lot. The mineralisation is thick, it's continuous, particularly on the northeast side of the deposit, snuggled up against the fault structure. It starts at surface and extends down to over 300 metres depth. Since discovering Asafu, we have identified several similar structural and geologic targets on the Tanda Aguela permits. And we have around 10 targets within a six kilometre radius of Asafu that have the potential to be satellite deposits. During the first half of 2023, almost 14,000 metres out of the 20,000 metres planned for the full year drilling program was completed across these targets. We continue to be encouraged by the results of the program, namely at the Parla Trend 2 and 3 targets, which locate four kilometres southwest of the Asafu deposit, and at the Konjagan target, which locates four kilometres southeast of the Asafu deposit. At the Parla targets, reconnaissance drilling has confirmed similar structures to Asafu, with a fault structure separating the Beremian volcanics from the Tarquayan sediments. Mineralisation has already been identified over 600 metres along a northwest strike and it remains open along strike and at depth. At the Konjagan target, the structural contact between the Tarquayan basin rocks and the Brimian basement has been well defined through geophysics. This has confirmed that the prospective structure hosting Asafu continues over 20 kilometres, extending four kilometres to the southeast to the Konjagan target and five kilometres northwest of Asafu towards the Gabango target. During the second half of 2023, the exploration program will continue to delineate both the Pala and Konjagan targets, while reconnaissance drilling will begin at the Gabango target. We are very excited about what we're seeing at Tanda Aguala. We see this as being the potential for our next cornerstone mine. I remain available for questions on Tanda Aguala and our exploration prospects at the end of the presentation. I will now hand back to Sebastian. Thank you, Jono, Jahaya, Guy and Mark. As you can see, we've continued to deliver against our key objectives during the first half of the year and remain on track to meet our full year guidance. We now enter the second half of 2023 with a higher quality portfolio and are progressing well towards unlocking our organic growth projects next year. With Sabadola Masawa and Lafigue completed, we will further upgrade our portfolio by increasing production while lowering our cost base. This will of course position us to generate strong cash flow, which will in turn allow us to continue to reward our stakeholders. None of the progress we've made would be possible without our team, and I would therefore like to thank them for their continued hard work and dedication. Thank you for joining us. I will now hand over to the operator for Q&A.